Good evening and welcome to the second installment of the Voice to the Voiceless Virtual Film Festival. I am Cam Argetsinger, the Senior Manager of Public Engagement at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. And, at the, um, and uh, tonight it is our pleasure to partner with the American Issues In Initiative to bring you Rigged, a film panel and mini film screening. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to view the film, and if not, we will be showing a short portion of the film tonight. Now, before I introduce you to tonight's moderator, I'd like, you to, like to make you aware of some of our upcoming programming at the center. On August 21st at 12 p.m., we have Educational Disparities and the Unequal Burden. Uh, this program is talking about the difficulties, especially in the uh, world of COVID, that our educational institutions are facing, especially when it comes to race. And we're also going to have a book talk on September 4th with Robert P. Jones um, discussing his book, White Too Long. And to wrap up our film festival, uh, we will have the film John Lewis, Good Trouble. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, that film, which you'll be able to watch ahead of time. We'll be speaking with the panel September 9th at 7 p.m. So we really hope that you're able to join us there. And tonight, I am pleased to introduce you to tonight's moderator, Mac Heller. Mac is the co-executive producer of Rigged, the voter suppression playbook. Mac was angered by the wave of voter suppression tactics sweeping the nation over the past decade. And Mac decided four years ago to make a film that would raise awareness of this threat to American democracy. Extreme racial and partisan gerrymandering, egregious uh, documentary requirements to register and or to vote, the elimination of polling places and a million other dirty tricks to make it difficult or impossible for some American citizens to vote. So Matt Keller, it is absolutely our pleasure to have you as our moderator this evening. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, and thanks everybody uh, for gathering tonight to talk about this important topic. Uh, I'll be really brief here. I just wanna frame uh, the clip that we're about to see. So today, our whole session takes an hour. Uh, uh, and we will have two clips. This first one uh, is 14 minutes long, and then we'll have some Q&A, uh, and then we'll have another clip um, that is about nine minutes long. First clip is uh, uh, voter purging in North Carolina. Second clip is gerrymandering and voter intimidation in Texas, both tried and true methods of uh, voter suppression. Uh, we made the film, those of you who uh, either have seen the film or will see the film, the full film is 70 minutes long. Uh, uh, we filmed during and after 2016 election. There's a great deal of excellent books written on vote suppression, uh, academic literature on voter suppression, uh, legal uh, discussions of voter suppression, and we wanted to add one uh, piece to that, which is a film telling the human stories of the American citizens denied the right to vote deliberately by laws making it more difficult or in some places impossible for them to vote. Uh, now in the course of that, we uh, gained unexpected access to some people on the other side of this debate, the people who are sure that our elections are characterized by widespread voter fraud uh, and are sure that much stronger laws need to be created uh, to beat back that fraud. So the question is, where do you show me the fraud? We had the opportunity, we were invited by the North Carolina in Voter Integrity Project, uh, and, and these fellas are in the clip that we're about to see, uh, to embed with them and drive around in the weeks before the election and have the camera rolling when they found voter fraud. Well, it won't shock anybody to hear that they didn't quite find it. It was somehow always around the next corner. And uh, at the, the end of honestly weeks of doing this, we say to them, hey fellas, you didn't find anything. And some would say, gosh, maybe that means it's not out there. Um, uh, but that's not what these guys said. What they said was, well, that just proves that it's even bigger than we thought. And the perpetrators are even more nefarious, more ruthless 
than even we had imagined. So that's a little bit what you're about to see. So let's roll uh, the first clip. And after the clip, it will be my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists and go right into some Q&A on, um, uh, on the issues at hand. At the uh, top of your screen is a Q&A function. Uh, and if you have questions that you'd like me to ask, please put them in the Q&A. Time is short, I'll do my best to get to them. Um, but you can do that, or if you have sassy remarks on what we filmed uh, during the course of the clip. So with that, let's go ahead and roll the clip. If you care about vote fraud, gentlemen, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thanks. Hey, if you care about vote fraud, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thank you. If you care about vote fraud, gentlemen, we're fighting it. We could use your help. Thanks. Thank you. I know a girl who votes eight times and has a million dollars in the bank and uh, is on food stamps to get everything for free in college. How do you know she votes eight times? <laughs> because we know her. Yes. Would you call me later? Before I launched the Voter Integrity Project, I was a... Military officer, uh, retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I became worried that this is a fragile system that depends on people, people being fair and honest. If you're worried about vote fraud, here's how we're fighting it tomorrow. We could use your help. They're hiding something, and we're on to them. And that's uh, the only question. It's not how many, it's, you know, we know they're doing it. The question is, how big a deal is it? Are they really trying to steal? an entire nation. And a lot of people are going through life with blinders on, or like I used to tell people, it's called the toilet paper tube syndrome. You got toilet paper tubes in front of your eyes, and all you see is that little bit of world right out in front of you through the toilet paper tubes. You don't see what all's going on out here. So if, if you're looking right here and you're not looking for voter fraud, you won't see voter fraud. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Evan Hires. I'm a 100% disabled veteran. I'm not married. I have the time, I have the skills, and have a desire to make sure that every American vote is legally cast. The Voting Integrity Project is interesting. They've always had a bit of a gadfly, renegade, vigilante voter, broad, you know, crusaders. They claimed that thousands of non-citizens were voting in a state where they would challenge voters at county boards of elections, and then they couldn't prove that really any of those were true. It's about time we turn the lights on in the kitchen and started cleaning the cockroaches out of here. Is there anyone in the audience today who received a notice that if they wish their name not to be removed from the voter rolls, they should be present? Stand up then and give us your name, please. Randy Burkett. Jamie Lee. Okay, Thank you, sir. John McKee. Well, North Carolina has a provision where a citizen can challenge the right of another citizen to vote. It's been on the books forever. Who else is going to know who's registered to vote unless another citizen does it? Some of the laws 
that wind up being discriminatory today had discriminatory intent when they were first written in the early 1900s as part of the Jim Crow laws. For example, voter purging laws to cleanse the rolls. And this was typically used in the Jim Crow area by whites who were trying to prevent newly enfranchised African Americans from having access to the ballot box. Michael's methodology involves finding voters that the state identified as inactive. These people have missed two federal elections, so they were listed as inactive. And I started sending letters to these inactive voters on the Cumberland County voter rolls. The ones that came back marked by the post office as undeliverable are considered evidence that the voter no longer resides at that address. And Mike challenged those voters. What the letter essentially says to Pyramid maintain my voter registration uh, as it is currently today. Whoever this guy is has challenged my right to vote. But the only way to defend your registration was to go in person. The process heavily favors the person doing the challenging. Not everybody is going to get a letter or have the time to defend it. What do you want this board to know concerning your place of residence? My primary place of residence is the address on my voter registration. Yeah, I'd like to motion that the challenge to Ms. Burkett be dismissed. Second. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 The challenge against you is dismissed. Voter registration remains. Now let's move on to Mr. John Lamont McKeithen, Jr. Some people have the knack of spotting anomalies. It's kind of like seeing a lump of coal in a bale of cotton. It, it'll just pop right out at you. So let me just ask you, what do you want this board to know concerning your place of residence? Uh, I do live and have lived at 7790 Stony Point Road. It's at 7790. Mm -hmm. okay, this is 7770. Is there a possibility that people got struck from the rolls mistakenly because the post office did not appropriately deliver the mailings to them? There is a small, small possibility on that. Challenges shall not be made indiscriminately. instilled in us to vote. My grandma raised me up and my sister up to vote. You know, when we turned 18, that was all right. <laughs> um, the address when I'm registered was 766 The Bridge Street Circle. I'm gonna have to have you standing in line so they can update you. Okay. All right, next voter please. I got an old one until I get Here, is this your address? You know me. She told me I could not vote at all because I got to re-register because I'm, I'm nowhere in the system. They're not making it easy at all. It's, it's tiresome. Yeah. When I found out um, that I was purged off the roads, and I was highly upset about it because, I, like I said, I mean, I grew up seeing my family vote. I know it's my God-given right today to vote. And I want to vote. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give concerning this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you vote? I do. All the evidence shows that when someone is purged from the rolls, it's extremely unlikely that they're going to re-register. It's hard to get them to re-register. And I worry that it will diminish the will to participate in the political process. And the danger is if states use unreliable information to take voters off the rolls, and if they do not give voters adequate notice and an opportunity to contest their removal, then we can have a situation where hundreds or even thousands of legitimate voters are being taken off of the rolls without their knowledge. Good morning. Persons were engaging in an attempt to get voters purged, especially African Americans. We are fighting this. We believe and we hope that the courts will agree with us and we will have an immediate temporary restraining order. Reverend Barber, uh, that guy's made a name for himself. 
<laughs> uh, congratulate him on a, on a well-funded. Uh, he has a lot of a lot of out-of-state funding money, and um, he knows how to play that race card better than anybody I've seen. And really, since the heyday of Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, he has played that race card so well. The NAACP filed a voter suppression lawsuit against the North Carolina Board of Elections, and today they won that case with a federal judge declaring that all voters purged from the voting rolls must be reinstated. The NAACP in North Carolina, they filed a lawsuit in federal court, uh, and actually they went judge shopping. They found, a, uh, they found a black female judge that they could influence uh, emotionally, in my, in my opinion, and not so humble opinion at that. Those of us who are the descendants of people who had their cars blown up out of side of churches right here in North Carolina when they were inside the church organizing for voting rights. When you come from that kind of lineage, you're not going to allow some loudmouth bigot to intimidate you. The courts have said, you know, you can't do any of this kind of stuff in the last 90 days. But they're going to put all these names back on the roll. We had a guy who worked for two years and got over 6,000 names removed in Cumberland County. And they claimed that we were targeting blacks. I would be glad to get drug into federal court because that will give me the opportunity to expose the problems that we have in this state. I get three hots and a cot and full medical care if I go to jail. Except how are you going to put me in jail for following the law? It's a Tuesday morning, but not just any Tuesday morning, Election Day. Good morning, America. Election Day 2016. Election Day officially starts right now. Tough decision. If Hillary wins, I'm done, probably. I, I don't know what will happen, but it scares the crap out of me, because if, if she wins, I'm afraid I'll be hunted down like a dog. <laughs> Michael Evan Hires. There you go. Thank you very much. Morning. My name's Michael Hires. Michael Hires. It's a pleasure to meet you. The, uh, well, you may not think so but when you re go back and research my name, but I've been the I'm the fellow that's been following the voter challenges. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, there are unscrupulous people out there, and they could go to the polls and impersonate mm -hmm. and impersonate somebody. I tell you what, I, a pleasure. if I could get more people of all I don't hate to say race because we're all human race, yes. but more ethnic backgrounds involved in this. Mm -hmm. That way, people wouldn't be taking pot shots at me. The NAACP is hot as a pistol at me right now, claiming I'm suppressing the black vote. Well, I think you would. They're accusing me of targeting minorities. Okay. They're trying to throw mud on the wall and trying to get it to stick. Really? But if you're interested in getting involved, uh, Look up voterintegrityproject.com. I will remember that. Right now I have to uh, go on look for work. Okay. Well, have a good day. What we're going to try and do is have data collectors sitting there passively collecting data on license plate numbers, see if we can figure out which people, if any, are going from voting location to voting location. The illegitimate reason would be if someone is what we call a serial voter and going from location A to B to C, using a different name at each one. And what we want to know is how prevalent is this? Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Emergency, emergency, call me. Uh, uh, can I talk about one state that's going to come at 7 o'clock that we so have? So what we could do is call the State Board of Elections and have them intervene. Yeah. But I just called somebody with an undercover camera. The bottom line is we're trying to collect evidence okay. of voter impersonation fraud. This is what I call criminal enterprise level vote fraud. See any vote fraud? <laughs> Not yet. We got to take this. Hey, Jam. Have you uh, seen any fraud, heard of any fraud? 
Uh, no, we, we have not. No, with only with only six data collectors, the odds of getting someone who showed up at two locations are slim and none. Basically, if, it, if you had, if you want to challenge me, you know, please contact me first. A challenge is a challenge, and if I challenge you to a chess match, I need you to play with me. You know, at least come back. You know, show me what you got. So, yeah. and until we can say, without doubt, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, until that means exactly what it says, we are still working toward becoming a more perfect union. All right, and before we get started back up again, just a friendly reminder that all comments of the moderators and guests of our programs represent the thoughts of each individual and do not represent any official position of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. And with that, Mac, it is all yours. Pam, thank you. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, uh, I misspoke before. I said we we're going to show two clips. We don't have time for that. We're going to show one. Um, so uh, let me introduce first uh, Billy Michael Honor. Uh, Billy is the Director of Faith organizing at the New Georgia Project. Uh, Billy is uh, in charge of mobilizing faith communities across the whole state of Georgia around a progressive faith-based political agenda. And in addition to doing that, he's the pastor of Pulse Church in downtown Atlanta, as well as the founder and facilitator of Truth on the Loose. His sermons and writings have been featured in the Huffington Post, theroot.com, Presbyterians Today magazine, Yahoo Voices, Odyssey Network, and Day One Media Ministry. He's been an adjunct professor of religious studies, and guest lecturer at various theological institutions throughout the country, currently working on his first book project scheduled for release next year. Uh, Christopher Bruce Esquire, the political director at the ACLU of Georgia, and he's been a leader in the fight for civil rights and liberties across the state and the country. He led a campaign against suppressing the black vote in South Atlanta by preventing the closure of polling locations in majority black districts during the 2016 mayoral election. He's also led a coalition of civil rights leaders and organizations that defeated legislation which would have jeopardized early voting hours and eliminated Sunday voting or souls to the polls programs. He's been featured in publications such as the Wall Street Journal and NPR and he's been a guest lecturer at many universities, including Harvard Law School, University of Georgia School of Law, and Emory. Mirna Perez is the director of the Brennan Center's Voting Rights and Elections Program. Uh, leads the program's research, advocacy, and litigation work nationwide. This may be, uh, and, and Mirna is the person for the job, the single most important spot in our country over the next uh, 80 days. Uh, Mirna is an expert on voting rights, election administration. She's the author of several nationally recognized reports and articles. Her work has been featured in media outlets across the country, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and MSNBC. She's testified before Congress and multiple state legislatures on voting rights and has been a lecturer at Columbia Law School and has served as an adjunct professor of clinical law at the NYU School of Law. So to all of our distinguished panelists, welcome and thank you for taking uh, time out of your day to talk with us about this important topic. Uh, I'm gonna refer briefly to the clip that we just saw. It's important to our discussion because here we go again. We've seen multiple claims of voter fraud from the president and people around him uh, in the media. And I'd, I'd like to start with Mirna, if I may, because you've been fighting this for so long. Why do you think these claims are being made? 
What are some of the consequences of these claims of voter fraud? And after Myrna, uh, Chris and Billy, uh, feel free to include comments if you'd like. Uh, voter fraud is alleged because people have concern over the browning of America. They are afraid that folks are going to be able to turn their numbers into political influence and power. And rather than compete uh, for voters' support, uh, they'd rather manipulate the rules of the game so that some people can participate and some people can't. Um, it has been extraordinarily disappointing and frustrating to see how much this claim of voter fraud has gotten racialized over the last few years. Um, the, when the president was first alleging uh, that he would have won the popular election, it was always because of um, a really improper word that he was using to describe folks who are undocumented. And those were the people committing voter fraud. Um, you heard the, the person in the clip use highly charged language of cockroaches and coal and just ugly, ugly stuff that I think reveals what's in their heart, which is that they think that some of us should um, be welcome in this democracy and other of us, of us are not. And they're trying to do everything that they can to keep some of us from participating. Um, what can we do about it? Uh, we've got to push back. We've got to call lies, lies. Um, we've got to continue to do the research that time and time again um, debunks it. Right now, we're in the middle, the Brennan Center and others are in the middle of a lawsuit in Pennsylvania because the Trump campaign sued uh, the Secretary of State of Pennsylvania um, alleging that some of the reforms that, that the secretary is implementing are going to cause voter fraud and they're not producing sufficient evidence and trying to walk away for it. But you can't make an allegation of fraud and not back it up because that tarnishes faith in our democracy. It polarizes people. It sends a message that some people are not welcome. And even the folks that know that it's fake they get disgusted by politicians being so manipulative and self-serving and dishonest and deceitful. So it, it bedraggles um, the very process that we use to resolve our political differences uh, peaceably. So um, it should be pushed back. It should be um, demanded proof. Um, it should be put into context. Um, and every single person on this, uh, on this video should know that time and time and time again, we find that it is extraordinarily rare for voters to commit fraud. Sometimes insiders will commit fraud upon voters and will exploit what they know to hurt voters for their own gain. But it is a, it is a vanishingly small percentage of actual voters that think that they're one or two like uh, misplaced vote ballots are worth the kind of trouble that they, uh, that they are creating. It is a lie, it is damaging, and we should reject it every time we hear it. You know, um, another hot topic in the media recently is the Postal Service and the changes that uh, have been introduced nationally just a few months to go before the election to uh, limit service, reduce service. Billy, uh, what is the, maybe we've succeeded in, in um, beating these back, maybe we haven't, uh, but Billy, what is the threat of the changes we're seeing at the post office? And uh, again, Christopher and Myrna, if, if you'd like to add something, please feel free. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a really, really important hot topic right now, uh, as well it should be. Uh, before I talk about the threat, let me just say one of the perhaps positive outcomes of all this attention uh, that's been placed is that now as a result of uh, these attacks, as I'll call them, on the Postal Service, the Postal Service is as popular as it's ever been uh, right now. So uh, that's one of the positive outcomes. There are, uh, I, you know, uh, Postal Service life matters type situations going on now. And I think it's a, it's a good thing. I think the only thing more popular in the Postal Service right now among the American people is probably Beyonce and pizza. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, the real threat uh, all here is about, first of all, it's a, a worker's rights threat as we've been talking about it. Um, and part of what that means is that there have been uh, conservative political forces for a long time who wanted to pri uh, privatize the post office. 
Um, and so one of the threats is that this uh, presents an opportunity for them to talk about the, ins the so-called insufficiencies, right, in the process of administration of the Postal Service, uh, how it costs too much uh, to be run by the government, right? So this uh, one threat is that this becomes a pretext for a conversation about pri uh, privatizing the post office, which is, in my assessment, uh, would not be good for workers, right? Would not be good for postal workers uh, who actually like uh, their government benefits, who actually like the uh, current process. The other threat uh, is, of course, the threat to democratic integrity, right? Uh, the whole idea that uh, by underfunding, uh, doing this uh, unprecedented situation of a health crisis, which has many people fearful for voting in public, underfunding that system uh, is just voter suppression by another name, period, end of story, right? Uh, and voter suppression has already been very well articulated by Myrna, uh, is a threat to our democracy. We should push back against it and uh, we should make sure we're vigilant on this and we should organize, 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 which means we should antagonize, litigate, uh, we should protest, whatever it takes to make sure that this system is funded to the extent that it needs to be so that people can cast their vote by mail ballots and we can have free and fair elections. Mike, if I could yeah. jump in real fast. Yes, please. Okay? <clears throat> so I agree everything what uh, Billy was saying. And if we look at the claims of voter fraud to attack people's confidence in voting by mail, those same people who are saying this, that voting by mail isn't secure, are the same people who are encouraging voters to vote by mail. So the president has made a tax on voting by mail, but he's voted by mail. And he's also sent out um, other campaign uh, literature to say vote by mail. So voting by mail is safe and secure. And voting by mail has been around since the Civil War. Uh, we know that 40% of all votes around 57.2 million in 2016 election were cast by mail-in votes. So I'll have to say to follow up everything that was said before, if you want to vote by mail, make sure that you request your ballot and return your ballot as soon as possible. That's how you can secure to make sure that your vote is um, counted. Yeah. Um, Christopher, let me follow up uh, about this uh, federal lawsuit the ACLU filed uh, to challenge the constitutionality of requiring voters to purchase stamps. Uh, for their ballots. How do you all see that and where do you think that'll go? Well, first, I want to give this disclaimer because I'm the political director, not the legal director, and he filed a lawsuit. It's a great lawsuit. It basically challenges the constitutionality of requiring voters to buy postage stamps when submitting mail-in absentee ballots and mailing in absentee ballot applications as well. So we know the United States Constitution is pretty clear. Poll taxes are unconstitutional altogether. Postage costs money, and in Georgia, for a lot of people, the most readily available option to vote is for them to submit their absentee ballot by mail. This is especially true uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic. So many voters do not feel safe casting their ballots in public. Getting stamps isn't easy as it seems. So most of the time, you can either order stamps online, but that requires internet access. And we all know that there's a lot of people in Georgia, especially in rural Georgia, who do not have internet, internet access. And there are some urban areas who are impoverished who do not have internet access as well. It also requires transportation if you don't have internet access to get to the post office, which again is not easily available to all Georgians. So it's not surprising that some of the elected officials in Georgia don't think that purchasing stamps is a burden, but for all Georgians, all Georgians aren't privileged. So. Our goal at the ACLU, and I'm sure it's for everybody else here, is to ensure that the constitutional right to vote is easily accessible and possible to everyone. So any policy that makes it harder is something that's unconstitutional and needs to be reviewed and fought for with all against, with all vigor. Um, I would say, like, I completely agree with Chris. Um, I also hope the audience thinks about, it's not just unconstitutional, it's silly. We are in the middle of a, reckoning in this country for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. We need our institutions of power to reflect all of us. We need to leverage the experience and expertise that we all come to bear as this country meets this very unique moment in history. And we are not going to get it right if we don't hear from everybody. Um, 
all of us are weakened when we are not able to contribute, when our democracy doesn't reflect all of us. So Chris is exactly right that it is unconstitutional. It's also un-American and it's stupid. Like we're not going to be the country that we want to be. We're not going to be the country we can be if we are not benefiting from all of the talent and lived experiences that we all come to bear. That we all Marina, let, Marina, let me um, uh, zero in on a, a kind of a parallel uh, vote by mail election administration question from the uh, Q&A, which uh, is don't, the, the invalidation of uh, mail-in ballots takes place at a higher rate uh, than in-person voting. Could you talk about that a little bit and give people well, some pointers question, on? Yeah, this is a question that we're getting a lot. Um, uh, the truth of the matter is that our elections are chronically underfunded, even in the best of circumstances. Even in the best of circumstances, we're asking our election administrators to do a Herculean job of keeping together our democracy with bubble gum and duct tape. Um, and when you have crisis like we have now, the cracks in the system are laid bare. Um, we are having a challenge because we need people to have a realistic option to vote by mail, and there are a number of states that are not ready. We're also having a challenge because at the same time that some people are trying to attack vote by mail, they're also underfunding polling places and consolidating polling places. I would have a lot more sympathy for the anti vote by mail people if they were like, fine, I'm going to invest a lot of resources to make that Polling places have what they need, but they're not. They're trying to starve both of these pipelines to voters. So Chris was 100% right. The single best way that you can secure your ballot is to make sure whichever way you choose to vote, you vote as early as possible. If you wanna vote in person and your state allows you, vote as early as you can. If you wanna vote uh, by mail, you know, request your absentee ballot quickly, turn it around quickly. Um, we're going to have a lot of glitches on election day, I think in part because the pandemic has completely disrupted everything, but Americans are up to the challenge and we need to be resilient and we need to plan ahead for it in a way um, that politicians and election administrators didn't do it. I think it's really sad that we have to be the ones to step into the breach, but we do. Um, and so all of us need to be ready to do our part. And if that means uh, voting early, uh, we need to do it. Uh, there's, uh, there's no real reason to assume that you're going to be much better off if you vote in person or much better off if you vote by mail. It's going to be a personal preference about what sort of risk you're willing to tolerate, but in either circumstance, you need to do it early. Yeah, so, you know, here, here are all these little vote suppression things. Oh, you need a stamp. Uh, oh, your signature is not right. We shouldn't think this is all we're going to get, right? It's, it's still 80 days to go. There's going to be more. We need to see them coming, call them out, identify them, litigate, agitate, motivate, et cetera. Um, Billy, let me go to you with what to me is, is a very hard question. So uh, in a lot of the protests uh, following the murder of George Floyd, you heard many younger protesters ask, why vote? That even, and their point being that even when they do vote, uh, things don't really change in terms of racial justice, economic justice, um, uh, climate change, et cetera. What would you say to young people shrugging their shoulders and saying, why vote? Well, I would say, first of all, we understand and we hear them. I don't think that uh, we gain much from shaming people uh, for uh, showing frustration uh, with a system that is, as we have been describing <laughs> uh, for the last 20 or so minutes. I think these are uh, real concerns and we need to hear that, first of all. I don't want to be the I don't want to be the person uh, that just uh, dismisses those concerns because they, they make sense. But what I've said to young people and I've been to these rallies, I've led these protests, and part of what we want to say is that the only way that you know your vote won't count is if you don't cast it. That's the sure way to know that your vote won't count. Uh, you have to participate in this democracy because for better or for worse until it is that uh, some way we can create a, another way of collectively doing life together, which is the way in which I describe politics, uh, we have to participate in it and we have to uh, vigorously fight to make it better. 
Uh, and so if you're concerned about DAs and sheriffs, right, which is uh, at the core of a lot of what was happening around the protests around police brutality and anti-Black violence, uh, if you're concerned about the individuals who have a direct impact on the decisions that get made around police officers and law enforcement individuals and prosecutions and all of that, then you have to vote because those for the uh, by and large are elected offices, right? Uh, and not just vote. I think what, uh, what young people want to hear is we have to vote and we have to educate ourselves about our voting to make sure that it's not just about casting a ballot, but it's about making an informed decision about the type of democracy that you want to see and voting for candidates uh, that reflect that vision or running yourself. That's the other thing. If you don't like what's going on, run yourself and then make the system hear you <laughs> by bringing crowds of people with you, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, finally, we live in a representative democracy. Uh, and as long as we live in a representative democracy, we don't take a uh, hand count on issues in terms of where we fall, 51% vote, that's not the way it works. We elect individuals to take those votes for us. And as long as that's the case, we have to vote and hold them accountable. And when they don't do what we want them to do, we have to vote to remove them, period. Thank you. Chris, let me uh, go to you um, on this topic of uh, disenfranchisement of persons convicted of a felony. ACLU has been very active in Florida, now coming up the 11th Circuit. Uh, can, can you give people some quick background on that and try and look ahead and what do you all see coming down the road? Well, we've uh, complimented the ACLU of Florida on Amendment 4. They're still fighting to make sure that felony disenfranchisement is um, completely wiped out altogether. And we've been fighting in Georgia, uh, something that has not picked up a lot of publicity is that we've been fighting for uh, people who have been convicted of felony to actually be reinstated. And I'm proud to say that the ACLU has the most progressive stance of, even if you are in prison or in jail, you should still be able to vote. You're still an American, you're still a citizen of this country, and you should not be stripped of your constitutional right, especially with the racist and prejudicial past that our criminal justice system has. Excuse me, criminal law system has. Because it's not justice if you're in jail for no reason. Or as we've seen, plenty of innocent people have been there. So at the ACLU, I have testified in front of the Senate Study Committee on felony disenfranchisement, pushing for voting rights for people who have been convicted of felonies. On a state level, we've helped draft legislation to reinstate people who have been convicted of felonies back on the voting rolls. And most importantly, we've been out in the community educating people of saying, just because you've been convicted of a felony does not mean that you should be taking uh, your right to vote should be taken away. It's not like they're going to vote, vote for something like all crimes going to be available or whatever. Like these are people, people again, who deserve to vote. And I'll bring up one example that really takes to me. Uh, there's a gentleman whose daughter goes to a local school district and the leadership that happens at the school district is horrible. And he knows that the school board uh, superintendent is a horrible person, not school superintendent, one of the school board members is not adequately equipped to do the job. And he wants to vote around, but he can't vote himself. So we're talking about someone who's being deprived of their education of their daughter, especially in these times when people are going at it um, at home. And that's where we really need uh, individuals to vote. I mean, we really need individuals to actually deal with education. School board member, that is a voting position. And just because I have been convicted of a felony in the past or maybe convicted of a felony right now, does not mean that I shouldn't have the right educate, um, be able to vote for somebody who's going to um, take up for my daughter. You know, every 4th of July, I try to reread the Frederick Douglass oration, um, What is the 4th of July to the Slave? And in that, uh, he remarks, I won't get this exactly right, that at the time, which is maybe 1850, 1852, uh, there were 55 crimes for which a black man could be executed uh, and a white man would not. And so, so the, the, the roots of this differential, differential treatment uh, go way back and we've got to work hard to find every little corner of it. We, we dip into it a little bit in the, in the film. We have uh, 
Mirna's colleague, Michael Waldman, uh, saying some of the uh, laws uh, used to purge people now on a racially differential basis had their roots in Jim Crow. And in fact, the North Carolina statute is a 1901 statute. Uh, and when you go back, it, it, the press at the time refers, uses the same language as, as Mike Hires, cleansed the voting rolls of the handful of remaining African Americans still trying to vote in North Carolina in 1901. Um, so we have a long way to go on this. Um, let me uh, uh, turn to the uh, Q&A again uh, from the audience. Mirna, when you were talking about uh, if you're voting by mail, be sure you vote early. If there's a problem with your signature, you know, make sure your ballot gets counted. Uh, I don't know if this is for Myrna or for Billy or Christopher, because you guys are in Georgia, but in Georgia, if your mail-in ballot is invalidated because you did one of these little mechanical things wrong, uh, do you hear about that? Or is it, can you track it in Georgia? What, what are the mechanics of this and what should people be doing? So maybe, maybe guys, I can start with the like national and you guys can drill down in Georgia. Is that okay? Okay, so uh, nationally, uh, we're a patchwork about how much what we would call, what we lawyers would call notice that voters get before it's a done deal that their ballot is rejected. Um, usually they get flagged because some sort of what we would call technical defect. Um, it's either the signature doesn't match, they forgot to fill out a form. We get a lot of people that don't sign it. Um, and in states that are doing uh, pro-voter work, they give the voter notice, they give them voter time to come in and correct it. Some states give a lot of time, some states get little. Um, but I'm going to put in the chat a, um, a link where we have a state-by-state -state, uh, assessment of what kinds of things they have. Georgia has gotten into a lot of mess in the past because it used to be really, really awful among the worst of the worst and having like discriminatory practices to check their signatures, terrible practices using provisional ballots. Um, there was a, a big law that got passed recently. There was guidance that people are trying to use to try and clean it up. There's a bunch of lawsuits. So it's kind of been cobbled together from lawsuits, settlements, legislation um, to try and make it a bit better because it used to be the poster child for the worst for the worst. So I'll let the two of them jump in now. But I will put in the chat where folks can go to see how states do this because this is something we track nationally. Now, Billy, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, I'll be brief with my remarks. And it's because, and I'll say this openly and everything else. Um, we're currently working with the Secretary of State's office and the local board of elections to recruit poll workers um, throughout the state so that they can actually take people who are, one, younger. The average age of a poll worker in Georgia is 72 years old. Um, so people who are less susceptible to COVID-19, uh, people who know how to work technology a little bit better, and people who can ask and answer these type of questions all the time. So. We're working to recruit over a thousand poll workers in our four largest counties, Cobb, Gwinnett, Fulton, and DeKalb. But we're also recruiting over 2,000 poll workers for the entire state, all 159 counties. So you can sign up on our website. And the reason why I'm saying all this is we, if you expect to be, and again, we work with the Secretary of State and local board of elections, but do you expect to be notified when this stuff happens? Don't, okay? Because we've seen time and time again that the state's either lacking notification for when they consider mistakes when it comes to exact match or signature matches, but it was really a mistake on their end. So it's time and time again, this happens. And it gets to a point where you have so much frustration where I compliment Billy for what he was saying, because I've seen Billy on panels talking about this, but Billy's also in the streets working uh, to make sure that people know about voting and fighting uh, for racial justice altogether. And I know because the ACLU has done legal observing within that to help him do what he's doing. So when it comes to things such as exact match, and I'll let you answer more on this, Billy, you need to know any and everything that has to deal with your rights when it comes to exact match. And if you need some extra help, you can go to the ACLUGA.org to find out more. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Bruce. And I mean, everything he said, the only thing I'll add to it is that the, the real deal is what we've been telling people is there is a blame game happening right now between the states and our 159 counties as a result of what happened in June 9th here in Georgia when we just had a hot mess uh, of an election. I mean, the, the, if you were watching the news, you saw it. It was it was bad. Uh, and so uh, our largest county, Fulton County, blamed blame the state and the state uh, the secretary of state was blaming uh, the Fulton County Board of Election. And so because we have so many boards of elections and they carry some responsibilities and the secretary of state carries some responsibilities, there's some time of breakdown uh, intentional or maybe not so much intentional, just incompetence around communications that happen. And so to, to, to Attorney Richard's point, uh, we're not telling people to depend upon whatever uh, has been said about when you're supposed to be notified. We want everyone to submit your mail-in ballot. We're telling every congregation, every faith leader that we organize with around Georgia, tell all your congregants and everybody that's listening to me by October 21st, right? Let it be done, have it, have it done, like send it off. So that at least gives you time, two weeks to check and call every day. Did you get my ballot? Did you get my mail-in ballot? Did you get my mail-in ballot? And then if it gets too close, you need to call ACLU, you need to call the New Georgia Project, you need to call somebody and tell them, hey, I don't know what's going on. I sent my mail-in ballot in well enough time and they still haven't received it so that someone can advocate on your behalf. Treat mail-in ballot like early voting because that's what it is, right? Don't count on these uh, communications uh, that are supposed to come out. Uh, vote as early as possible. You know, uh, when, when people's votes are suppressed, it can be a combination of incompetence and intent uh, by the by the election officials, and th there's going to be such chaos uh, in the final ten days this year, and probably the four or five days after the election, that you have to defend your vote, and you 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 can't assume anything, and you've got to defend it, and we can't use that to discourage people. We use it to inspire people. Uh, uh, your predecessors fought for their right to vote, everybody in this country, and you're going to fight for your right to vote too. No one's going to hand it to you. You know, we have a it, it, kind of parallel question uh, in the chat from um, concerning uh, purging, which is, does anybody compare the voter rolls uh, to the list of taxpayers? So in other words, the, the, the purging rolls and the, the voters to be purged, are they still in the county and paying tax? Uh, I, I will comment in the making of the film in that North Carolina uh, sequence, uh, I was shocked at how little process there was. The answer in Cumberland County, North Carolina is no. Uh, well, did they call them up? No. Did they ask, did they use any of the 2000 modern ways of communicating with people to try and find out if these people about to lose this constitutional right are still alive and living in the county. No. So the absence of process was shocking. Well, the part that like infuriates me is that some rando deputized themselves to be the police person of the polls. Um, and, and, so and the board this, of elections just rolled over. Yeah, this was not an election administrator who was investigating a well-founded complaint. This was someone who by his own admission had nothing better to do but to go and decide that he was going to uh, police and terrorize uh, and disenfranchise uh, other voters. And I think we have a real problem where there are these, you know, self-proclaimed, self-identified protectors of the polls that um, are actually just trying to stop us from voting. Like we were in a lawsuit in Michigan where a group just decided on their own accord that they were going to figure out who had died uh, and should have been on the roll, shouldn't have been on the rolls before. They gave that list to the city of Detroit. And when the city of Detroit didn't purge them immediately, they sued them. For, whereas if they had just relied on that data, somebody else would have gone and sued them for just disenfranchising random voters. We need to leave the uh, deciding who's in the business of being eligible and who's not to the professionals, like to folks who have evidence, to the folks that uh, recognize that, that uh, there's a balance of a bunch of things and to the folks who have the resources to be able to do this right. And when there's any question, any question tie goes to the voter. 
Um, and that's I, and, and that's the part that I think is the worst is that somebody just decided by themselves that they're going to police other voters. And their accuracy rate was horrible. So in one well, of afternoon, because they're amateurs at this, we like, took that list of of 3,500 and started finding all kinds of voters and called them up. That's how we got to Karen Wilson McCoy and many others. And there, there's that famous thing recently in Ohio where Ohio is about to purge 240,000 people and the League of Women Voters gets the list and says, oops, 35,000 of them are improper purges. You guys should be more careful. And th this is people's, this is our democracy. Any of these elections in any state, certainly Georgia, certainly Michigan, certainly Wisconsin, are, could turn on many fewer votes than that. So this purging makes me crazy. <coughs> um, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna have to wrap up here uh, in, in a few minutes. We need to talk about in-person voting. We've talked a lot about vote by mail. Um, one of our uh, attendants is, is noting that Governor Kemp's latest executive order prohibits requiring masks at polling places, even if the locality has a, a mask mandate. Mirna, I know you've been active um, in uh, thinking through uh, with the Infectious Diseases Society of America how to create guidelines for healthy practices at polling places. Could you talk about those a little bit and do you have any sense of how adoption is in various states across the country? Well, well, Chris and Billy are on the front lines of this in Georgia. What we're doing is getting um, infectious disease specialists, like people whose job it is to keep people's public health, to provide guidelines and to assure people that this can be done right if people are thoughtful um, and, and mean it. It's sensible. Um, you know, there's going to be a resource problem. There's going to be a will problem. Uh, you said some of it was some of the disenfranchisement was like suppression and some of it was incompetence. I think there's a third category of what I would call willful neglect, like people who know that systemic racism and implicit bias are present in the very ways in which we administer elections, the way we count ballots, the way we decide what these rules are. And when you're not doing anything about it and it's been pointed out to you, I don't think you quite get the benefit of incompetence. I think, I think you, you have a little bit more responsibility for your choosing not to prioritize a way to fix it. Um, but uh, there's a lot of work being done both by both of these guys group in, uh, in Georgia as to the particulars. So um, I'm gonna let them have the last, the last minutes on this. So I, I want to echo and thank Myrna for all the work that she's done nationwide and the work that she's done in Georgia. Make sure you follow her. Make sure you follow her on Twitter as well. But when it comes down to it, and she hit it right on the head when it says that third prong of willful neglect, we pointed out to the Board of Elections, you do not have enough uh, poll workers at a place. And these poll workers, they are not adequately staffed or trained. So they know themselves that they can't handle some of these issues or the problems. So these Band-Aid type of fixes that are happening, there needs to be a lot more. And I would say that there's a lot of them who are trying to, a lot of Board of Elections who are trying to do that. And there are others who just don't care. So we need to make sure that, hey, it's not about complaining anymore. It's about getting back in there and saying, well, I want to be a poll worker because I'm not going to engage in voter suppression. And I'm going to engage in more um, official business to make sure I'm adequately educated and trained to do this. This is your democracy, so you should be able to make this happen. And as far as the governor's executive order, we're talking to the governor about taking that back. But we know we're also going to have poll monitors who are going to be out there encouraging people with masks and saying, here, you can take a mask. Oh, you don't have a mask? You can take this one. Have a water with it, too, because we want to make sure that everyone is protected during COVID-19 and these times and everyone can vote. Yeah, just to follow up, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I would just say to every voter out there, uh, I watched on June 9th, the long lines, people stood in the rain 
here in Georgia. I mean, it was raining. It seems like it rains every election day here, but, but it was raining and people stood in line to persist to participate in this democracy. People are fired up and they want to see their votes cast. Uh, it's a, it's, this, there's a lot at stake in this election. And so people are gonna show up. There's gonna be long lines uh, in November. You can count on it. Uh, but what I want everybody to do, uh, in addition to all the things that have been said, is you have to look out for your own self-interest. Uh, the numbers came out. Uh, and even the White House uh, released and said that Georgia uh, is among uh, the leading state with new cases of COVID-19. Uh, and that's because of two reasons. One is for a collective failure of leadership on multiple levels. But here's the other reason. Too many Georgians have not been exercising requisite self-regard for one's own public health. And I just got to say that in love. So don't be caught on election day committing stupid by not wearing a mask or neglecting to take the mask that's going to be offered to you by some nice poll monitor or one doing precinct chaplain. Just, just guard yourself, cast your vote, and go home. Let's look after ourselves and then also get in the process of fighting so that our elected officials make sure to protect us and resource us in the proper ways. Really glad to be here with Myrna and Chris who are doing such great work. Uh, let's fight and make sure this election is free and fair. I want to thank uh, all three of our panelists, uh, Billy, Christopher, Myrna, for your, for your work, for your inspirational comments, for your deep knowledge of the ins and outs of these issues nationally, you know, down to, down to the micro uh, of, of local. Uh, no state matters more than Georgia uh, in this coming election. And uh, uh, the work you all are doing is inspirational. And, and we're all so grateful for it. So thank you and thank you for carving a little time out uh, from your demanding days to talk with us here uh, this evening. Cam, I'm gonna hand it back to you after one more comment from me, which is if that rigged uh, the voter suppression playbook, the whole film is 70 minutes long, goes through multiple types of voter suppression. The intent of the film is to educate and motivate. At the end of this film, your congregation, your community group, your classroom will understand voter suppression, what it is, where it comes from, who's doing it. If anybody wants to show that film to a group, please contact us. We provide the film for free. Go to rigthefilm.com, go to the button, request a screening, and uh, we'll be talking to you, and uh, it'll be easy to do, and we're going to be doing that as hard as we can now through November 3rd. So, Cam, back to you. Thank you so much, Mac, and thank you to our panel as well. That was an amazing discussion. We uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate all of you being here with us tonight. Um, make sure that you're checking out our weekly action checklist. And this week, we are asking that you ensure you are registered to vote. If you can, become an election poll worker. Uh, sign the Brennan Center's petition. Um, and the website is right there for that. Also join the new Georgia Projects agenda for young, young Georgians. That's getting young people involved, getting them out to uh, um, work at the polls and make sure that they're registered to vote. And also be an ambassador for the Campaign for Equal Dignity. Uh, check out our uh, website at equaldignity.org and uh, please sign our petition and see what other actions you can take and encourage 10 of your friends to uh, do that with you. Again, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you to everyone who came in and listened. And if you haven't had the chance to watch Rigged, uh, I absolutely uh, recommend it. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.